I will be forever the myth. You're the king of kings, <laughs> There's always a pecking order. The little peckers never mess with the big peckers. So I'm a rooster, and he's a chicken for the week. All right, welcome back to the Bodybuilding Legends podcast, and I have some real legends with me today. We've got the Mr. Olympia coming up in a couple of weeks, and all of these legends here are going to be commentating on the Mr. Olympia. So let me introduce each one of you guys. First, we got Sean Ray. Sean was uh, top five in the Mr. Olympia 12 consecutive years in a row. And then we've got Lee Labrada. Lee was top four in the Mr. Olympia, let's see, seven consecutive Mr. Olympias in a row. And then we've got Rich Gaspari. Rich was runner-up at the Mr. Olympia three times, and he was also the first Arnold Classic winner. And finally, last but least, we've got uh, Mr. Lee Haney, eight-time Mr. Olympia. So welcome to the show, guys. I'm glad you guys could all make it in with your busy schedules. Good to be here. Thank you. Thank you. If the well, music man is ready, let's pose down, guys. You ready? <laughs> <laughs> no? Hey, Nobody wants to do this? You lift up that shirt first. You lift up that shirt first. <laughs> yeah. Shirt's off. <laughs> I knew Lee would say that. He's been working for this day. <laughs> Sean, let me start with you. What, what inspired you to get all these uh, former champions, former legends, uh, back to the Mr. Olympia to commentate? I thought it was a great idea. Yeah, well, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time. I, I got started in 1983, and my first Olympia was in 1988. Of course, Lee was on his fourth victory there, and, and uh, Labrada and Gaspari were already on the landscape. But I've been doing the commentating for many years. As a matter of fact, my final Olympia in 2001, I was the color commentator on Fox Sports Net, calling that, that Olympia as I was on my way out the door. But it's something I've always enjoyed doing in terms of uh, commentating and as things kind of progress through AMI and into Jake Wood, uh, I've always been of the opinion when I watch Monday night football, for example, if you watch even baseball, the guys that played the game are the ones that are most qualified to talk about what's happening to the person that doesn't know what they're looking at. Um, you don't have to be Mr. Olympia to talk about it, but with the wealth of information that uh, I gathered through this, being on the stage and not missing the Mr. Olympia since 1988, I've never missed an Olympia in person along with the 1989 Arnold Classic that Rich won. I've never missed an Arnold Classic, uh, knock on wood, never been sick. But that shows you my, my passion for the game. Even though I'm not on the stage, I'm very passionate about watching it and enjoying it. And uh, as we start to graduate further and further away from the stage, who better to qualified than the great Lee Haney to talk about it? I remember he commentated one year. Uh, I've been trying to drag Lee into behind the microphone for many years because he's one of the most articulate uh, bodybuilders and, and has a very artistic view of what people that at home would be seeing. So having his voice is huge. And I, I, I grabbed Gaspari by the head, rubbed it like this, and I drug him in last year. And well, he did a, a phenomenal job commentating on the Mr. Olympia. Um, so these are, these are the people I came up admiring, respecting, and knowing that they're overqualified to talk about what we're seeing on that stage. So I wanted them to to, to give back. Like I want, I want to hear their points of views. Cause they're all very different. We all come from different, uh, a background, you know, Rich is Cuban. I mean, uh, Lee Labrada is Cuban and, and Lee Haney's from the South out there in South Carolina and Georgia. And you got the Italian over there, rich, the, uh, rich, the itch. Now we don't have to like, there's no testosterone involved here. We got experience. We're, we're fathers and, and businessmen and entrepreneurs, but we're still fans. We've all got our own, involvement in the sport and and i definitely want to hear their input coming into this year's olympia yeah and speaking of fathers lee labrada uh you got your son hunter coming into the olympia for the second year in a row what's that going to be like commentating and watching your son uh competing in the mr olympia well for, for fortunately i'm going to be commentating on the classic physique okay. and and so i'll uh, i'll be uh, uh i'll be the guy Jumping up and down in a seat on the first <laughs> row. <when> the <laughs> <out there. laughs> I, I look like a little kid fanboy, you know, but uh, no, it's just, uh, it's, uh, it's really uh, uh, surreal. It's almost like a uh, second bite of, uh, of the apple, you know, and um, my gosh, I never thought in a million years that, uh, that he'd be able to, to uh, uh, do that at that level, you know, but uh, Hey, you know, uh, kudos to him. He works extremely hard and, I uh, was very focused and uh, he's, uh, you know, he's nervous place. Yeah. I still remember watching um, the Arnold classic from 93 on TV 
and your wife was holding, or I don't know if she was holding him, but he was in the side, he was in the background in the, in the backstage area watching you pose. That was pretty cool. And now he's on stage. That's wild. Yeah, that was, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. I tease him that uh, the first time he was ever on a IFBB pro stage was uh, when he was about five months old. You know, uh, when I won the, um, the uh, IFBB pro world cup in Spain in 1992, uh, we had Hunter along with us and uh, I brought him up on stage and, uh, you know, we did the, uh, the Lion King thing. So, uh, yeah. We, it, it, it was, uh, it was, it was a great uh, photo op. Yeah. Hey, Rich, we've got a lot of young guys going in the show this year. A lot of newcomers are coming in. Uh, a lot of people are talking about like Nick Walker. He's 26, but you were like uh, 22, right? When you did your first Olympia in 1985. Yeah, my, yeah 1985 I was 22 years old. The first. What was, what was that like? I can't even imagine being that young and going in your first. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think about it now and it's, it was just a phenomenal experience. But when you're in it, you're so okay. focused just being in it. And, you know, I started as Lee Haney's training partner, you know, in 1984. And I learned all Lee's secrets, you know, I was able to <laughs> <laughs> use them. Then he then tried to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> he tried to take my life. <laughs> <laughs> so no, you know, you know, it, it was unbelievable because, you know, that 84, the when I trained with Lee, it was just a great experience. The knowledge he taught me, I still always appreciate what I learned. And then I had my own style of training that, you know, I ended up going into the Night of the Champions and coming second to Beckles and then going in the Olympia and getting third on my first try was just unbelievable because I was 22 years old. I was on stage with, you know, my former training partner that I, you know, thought he was the best. And then guys like Tom Platts, Sergio Oliva. Yeah. I, I, these are all my <laughs> heroes, Robbie Robinson. So it was just an unbelievable experience. I was this kid on stage and – I mean, Lee knows my personality. I was very competitive and very hungry. So yeah. I think about now, I said, wow, I was on stage with some of the greatest bodybuilders. But when I was in that focus, I was just like, I want to beat all these guys. <laughs> <laughs> it was probably not till years later, right, Rich, that you were able to appreciate who you're up against. I, I mean, it definitely, I, you think about it now, I, you know, I appreciate all the years, the head to head with Lee Andy, the head to head with Lee Labrada. It, it was, it's, to me, it was a phenomenal experience that, you know, for what I was able to do. And it was just a great time in my life. Yeah, for sure. Hey, Lee, when Lee Haney, when you went to your first Olympia in uh, 83, um, you were going up against some real old guard guys like, you know, Frank yeah. Fain, uh, Mohamed McAway, um, Samir Banu. What was that like? Because, again, these were guys that you grew up reading in the magazine. Uh, it, it was a similar feeling that Rich just expressed. Mm -hmm. You know, to be on the stage with Sergio Olivier, <laughs> of course, you know, you you didn't compete against Sergio. He's a myth. Right. Yeah. He was just there to do a guest posing appearance. That's, that's <laughs> what that was, <laughs> you know. But it was a truly an honor. And to have grown up and seeing these guys, you know, pictures all over my wall at home and here I'm on the stage with them. It was like a, like a dream come true. And, man, I, I cherish that more and more as I look back on it. So, wow, you know. Yeah. I got a taste of an era that uh, few had a chance to experience. And Rich was one of those who sort of got a little taste of it also. Mm -hmm. But I was I was a kid on the block. I never will forget meeting uh, Albert at the uh, IFBB World Championships. And, uh, you know, of course, I was in the event. He was just a guest poser. And I laid down on the bench and did some warm ups on the bench press. And then Apple looked at me and said, You put the oil on the bench, man. <laughs> you know? What are you going to say? Apple said, You put oil on the bench, man. Golly, <laughs> you know, what did I do wrong? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, was, that was a unique experience, man. But uh, I wouldn't take nothing for it. It, it enriched me as a competitor and gave me a great appreciation for uh, that opportunity of being able to just be on the stage with these, these legends. Yeah. Hey, Sean, you came up a little bit after all these guys. Um, how did you feel going in your first Olympia? Did you feel more like a fan or uh, were you ready to kill it? Like, like Rich was. Yeah. I, I don't think the experience is any different during this era. I mean, we were all fans first. Yeah. He's talking about 1985 in 1985. Um, I was over in Australia winning the junior world championships and Albert Beckles was the guest poser 
just came off a second place behind Lee. Lee, you might know this better than me. What was what was Albert then? Was he like 56 years old? I mean, <laughs> yeah, 1985, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm all the way over in Australia and I get a chance to meet Albert Beckles and I'm actually competing and he's guest posing like he was for Lee. Um, he, he, I didn't screw up. He didn't yell at me. But he was fresh off of getting second. So here I was in 85 having, having this opportunity to look at an Olympian up close and impersonal all the way on the other side of the world. And this guy, you know, he's old enough to be my dad thinking, I'll never get there. Like this guy's a million years away from my reality of what I thought I was physically capable of. And so the respect and the admiration for the longevity of Albert's career, not to mention he was standing next to Lee Haney only – couple of months before that at the Olympia, uh, that fan type of a feeling, it never leaves you. I was a competitor too, uh, but there's a lot of things that go on in your head when you're standing next to these guys. My first Olympia, it was Labrada, it was uh, uh, Barry DeMay, and it was Lee Haney um, and Gaspari in that final pose down at the 1980 Olympia. So naturally, I'm like literally backstage staring at the monitor like a kid at home, not realizing that this is the contest I was actually in. Like, I'm, I got a front row seat at, you know, the things I have at home in my magazine. So, yeah, that fan feeling never leaves you. I'm, I'm 56 years old two days ago, and I still feel like, you know, here they are. There's Haney, the Caspari, and Labrada. I'm like, these are my friends now, but it takes me back to a place where I still have their pictures on my wall. Uh, I can't believe it's kind of surreal that we've come this far, this many years. We're all healthy, uh, and we're still in the game. So who would have thought that as a young kid coming up in bodybuilder that, we would be here in this moment today. You think it's different for the guys today, the younger guys who don't have the magazines, like we had the magazines. And I think when you see someone in person, after you read them, read about them in the magazines, it's like seeing a movie star for the first time. These guys today, the kids today, the younger bodybuilders, they have like the internet. So they're seeing these guys all the time. You think it's a different experience. Like last year, some of the newer guys, do you think they were blown away by seeing Phil Heath by being on the stage with Phil Heath? I'll let LeBrada take that because your son, what did your son say about getting, he, he beat Dexter Jackson last year, didn't he, Lee? Well, yeah. you, you know, here, here's the thing, you know, the, uh, the, I, I think the word beat is too strong, you know, mm -hmm. because when you're talking about a legend like Dexter Jackson, you yeah. know, uh, Hunter felt incredibly honored just to stand next to him. In fact, I, he, he, you know, he, you know, just basically leaned over and told him as much. And uh, Dexter took him under his wing. I mean, they they stood next to each other pretty much the whole show, you know. And and they were uh, they were they were uh, talking, and and Hunter was just so impressed with uh, with with Dexter, and and just blown away by the uh, you know just the the privilege of being able to stand with these guys, all legends in their own right. You know, and, um, you know, and, and, and I, I want to echo what everybody else has said, you know, it's like I'm looking at each one of you guys on the screen here, you know, and there's there's uh, uh, some fanboy. In me. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's it's uh, it, it's amazing how that part of you never goes away because you love the sport. You recognize the uh, the impact, the in, indelible uh, uh, fingerprints that each each one of you has uh, had on the sport, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, Rich, you were uh, a fan of the sport since you were like 14. What was the first Olympia that you remember like reading about in the magazines or, or actually seeing in person or on TV? I mean, I started looking at magazines back in uh, when Frank Zane was Mr. Olympia. So I remember the whole, you know, I guess it was uh, 77, 78, 79. Okay. And uh, when it was Zane and Robbie Robinson and Zane. And Mike Menser, I remember reading the magazines. That's when I was a you know, big fan reading the magazines and seeing, you know, a guy like Zane and say, can I, you know, would I ever be able to compete against these guys? For me, I was just this kid in New Jersey yeah. that, you know, just, you know, wanted to win the local show <laughs> first. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And, and Lee, Lee Haney, uh, you were at the 81 Olympia, right? Then I, re I read somewhere you were up in the balcony watching the one that Franco won. Yes, uh, man, that was the first one that I've seen up close and personal. I never will forget seeing Arnold walk down the aisle and he had his plaid shirt on, his jeans, man, he looked so cool. And there I was, <laughs> along with some of my other gym rat buddies, you know, we had uh, <laughs> leased the van and all of us rolled up together, slept on the floor in, in one room, <laughs> one hotel room. Man, it was so cool. But 
that was very life changing for me to actually mm -hmm. get to see up close and personal all on and Frank on the stage competing along with Tom Platt. I think Robbie and Roy Callender was, was there. It was just absolutely mine. I think Dennis Tina Reno. I mean, mm. read and see these guys in the magazines and you're looking at them in person. And yeah, it was just so inspiring and to think that maybe one day I would uh, be able to be on stage was just, yeah, it was just unimaginable, you know. It was just like being in a, in a dreamland. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Lee, um, I wanted to ask you, of course, about posing. It seems like I'm noticing some of the pros today, they're, they seem to be taking more uh, effort into their posing. Of course, your son, Hunter, is, is going to do a great job with his posing. I saw James Hollinghead, Hollingshead hired a guy to help him with his posing. So where did you get the inspiration to get your posing from? I think all you guys were great posers in your day. I think you all did a fantastic job with that, and you were all inspirational. Um, so where was your inspiration coming from, Lee? You, you know, the, uh, the, my, uh, uh, the people that I looked up to back in the day as far as posers were, uh, were Ed Corny. Yeah. If, uh, you guys will recall seeing the original Pumping Iron and watching him move on stage and, and mm -hmm. gliding, you know, and I thought to myself, man, that's just poetry and motion. Yeah. And so he was one of the early influences. Another one that I thought was a, a, an exceptional poser uh, that uh, was, uh, you know, just just slightly before my era was uh, Muhammad McAway. Mm -hmm. And and, uh, you know, so I, I, I really like the uh, the posing that these guys did. And, um, you know, I, I liked the idea of uh, being able to not only do the static poses, but to be able to go from pose to pose artistically. You know, yeah. uh, that whole statue in motion uh, approach to it. And, uh, you know, I, I want to just touch on something that you said uh, just a second ago about these guys today that they're starting to take the posing more seriously. And I, and I think that they are. And mm -hmm. I think that there's been a bit of a renaissance with the emphasis on posing, especially in the classic physique category and i think that some of that has bled over and the uh, the open guys are are realizing how much better they look you know when they move right you know in between poses and and how much more that they can engage the crowd and create that emotional bond with them when they're they're actually moving in in an artistic fashion yeah what do you think they need to do more of uh, as far as the posing anybody Practice. Practice, <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, you know, in, in, when I lived in California, you know, like I said, with Lee, we practiced hours, you yeah. know, just going through the movements. And I, the, the criticism I have on today's bodybuilders, and I know it's changing, is they just don't practice. Mm -hmm. They sit there and, you know, and I, I'm not going to mention IPB Pro goes, I go, so what's your routine? He goes, I'm just going to wing it. Wing <laughs> it? Yeah. Wing it, don't it. You're a pro and you're going to wing it? Yeah. I, you know, I, I mean, I had to go against guys like Lee Lebron and, and it mattered, like, with yeah. the posing. And I had to come up with routines because I knew he had a great routine. And mm -hmm. it, it put more emphasis into trying to come up with, a, you know, your own style of posing to go against another guy that you know was going to kill it. So yeah. I just think that the new breed of bodybuilders, as Lee said, is they want to be able to emphasize showing up what they have. They get these great bodies – but they don't know how to display them. They don't know how to, you know, I watch Lee on, you know, Instagram. It's not just hitting the pose. It's, it's the transition from pose to pose that they got to understand. And that takes practice. Yeah. It seems like a lot of them practice the mandatories, but when it comes to the free posing, they don't put much into that. A, a lot of them. And, and even the mandatories, it doesn't matter. It's, it's flowing from the mandatories yeah. from pose to pose. You, you could just do it. Boom, boom. He looked like a robot, but, you know, I mean, from Lee Haney to me to Lee Labrada, you know, and Sean, we all really looked at posing as being very important. Yeah. You know, part of, you know your and, and John, I want to say, too, back, you know, our role models. Yeah. Uh, as Lee, Lee was saying, as Rich was saying, as, as Sean, they were Frank Zane. They were home. <laughs> they were Robbie. They were the master poser, Ed Corny. Uh, I mean, Muhammad McCowey tore my butt up all over Europe. <laughs> I mean, he, he was just a tiny guy. But man, yeah. he could transition. You never saw a weak 
a weak spot in Muhammad because he transitioned so well. It was, right. as Lee said, uh, it was like muscular ballet, mm -hmm. so to speak. It was mm -hmm. beautiful. And so that's where we got our emphasis from. Now you have this next generation whereby, you know, the judges wasn't uh, really pushing a point system as far as posing in the last few years. But that has somewhat changed as, as, um, as Rich was saying with classic bodybuilding. Well, they say classic physique is really classic bodybuilding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's really who we are. And, you know, it, it makes a huge difference. We wanted to make sure we display on the highest level because there was a point system. Now you see some of the guys come out and they'll walk out on stage and they'll have you to do that. Come, you know, <laughs> give regional people to regional clap their hands, they'll clap. Right. You know, so that means you got to work and create a posing routine. I never will forget it. 1983, after my first Olympia, finished up. We were back at Albert Booth Sex Gym and the after party. And Arnold was one of the commentators there. And he came over uh, uh, while me and Shirley were sitting. He said, Lee, uh, you look great there on stage. You got an incredible physique. He said, but Lee, you cannot take the same presentation that you won the the IBB World Championship with and the NPC Nationals on a professional level competing against these legends. You have right. to do better with your posing. And with that being said, he said, listen, when we get back to the US, cause we were in Germany at the time, I want you to come to my office. I'm going to introduce you to my posing coach. She can help you with your transitions and movement. So be there and I'll help you in the way I can. And guess what? I had my butt there. Yeah. You know, so it made all the difference. It mattered to him. So I made sure that it mattered to me. And that's what we call the old school way of doing things, which made all the difference when we hit the stage. Yeah, I think people watch that um, because clearly if you were taking the time to do that, they had to take the time to up their game. And then it just kind of snowballs generationally. Like after you it came, you know, Bob Paris and LeBron and came all these other athletes. We're looking at what other athletes are doing. So we see that everyone's paying attention to that. Now, I don't think the other athletes are really looking at the other athletes. And yeah. because there's yeah. no point system, because uh, the, the posing isn't a part of the overall scoring, they figure, hey, I'll do what that guy did. Just play whatever. I mean, pose to house music. So they yeah, got to get back to that. That's one thing that I want to just add real quick is, uh, you know, I want to point out that I think that one of the reasons that these guys have gotten lazy on posing in the last few years is because they're not being scored on that the way that they, they were. So th they, they think to themselves, it doesn't make a difference, mm -hmm. you know? And so, you know, one of two things has to happen. You know, we have to bring back a posing round where they pick up a yeah. certain number of points on that presentation. Yeah you know, irrelevant of what their body looks like. They're awarded some points for presentation, you know, that or there has to be money involved as, you know, for a best poser award. You know, if you have uh, like what Arnold did, um, you know, at, at uh, the, the last classic, um, you know, where you have $10,000 awarded to the best poser, some of these guys are going to start working on their routines. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. And we've added, we've added that with the help of uh, my partner in Hawaii, Dr. Morales, who Lee, you know very well, He's uh, ponied up the best poser award to match what Arnold's doing for the bodybuilders for the classic physiques So this year, for the very first time, the classic physique competitors will be vying for a $10,000 best poser award. So these athletes, oh, really? that don't, the oh, ones that know great. they, the ones that know they cannot win have an opportunity to win this award because you can be dead last. If you're on that stage and you put the effort into your posing routine, you can walk off with 10 grand. That's a pretty good incentive for and, anybody. And, and the recognition. And the recognition. Yeah. And, and, the, and the idea that you could be the first recipient of this award. Because, look, Rich made a career off of winning the Arnold Classic. Forget about the three runner-ups. He was the first yeah. and the original Arnold Classic champion forever. So, like, with this type of an award being presented to the Classic physique guys, it matters to them. And they're already elevating their game in the posing. It's going to make the bodybuilders yeah. have to pay attention uh, even more to their posing routines, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, I think what Rich said, too, makes a good point. You know, back then when you guys were all competing together, you knew, like Rich knew, Lee was going to do a great routine. Sean was going to do a great routine. So if you came out and did a lackluster routine, I mean, just, <laughs> it's just a pride thing, right? It's, mm -hmm. you, want to, you want to show your best. Well, Lee Haney said something very funny. 
uh, he was commentating, I believe, the Olympia one year, right? And this yeah. guy, Lee, <laughs> Lee, you'll remember, this guy came out and a big guy came out and he's posing to like dramatic, hardcore music. And what do you say, Lee? Some guy came out and he was posing like Twinkle Toes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's exactly what happened. Gunther Schlierkamp of Germany. Now also on stage are Lee Haney and Dr. Tom Dieters. Let's hear what they have to say. A man, Lee. Notice you did not use that twinkle pole music. When you got muscle, you should use muscle music. Yeah. A former Mr. Olympia calling for muscle music, Frank. And that brings David Durth onto the stage from Princeton, New Jersey. Posing to twinkle toe music. That's what the audience laughter is about. Dirth being the great champion that he is, he's going along with it. That's David Dirth from Princeton, New Jersey. Nice recovery. <laughs> oh, that was so funny. I forget what year that was. That was a crack up. Because, you know, you can't take somebody that's 6'1 and go out and do a Muhammad McAway routine. It just doesn't look right for some yeah. guys. They're not built that way. Yeah. So if you're big like Lee Haney, Lee Haney said in 91, it's going to take a Titan to beat a Titan, right? So yeah. you had Haney and Dorian, and that's exactly what it came down to because a little guy wasn't going to take him out. I mean, um, but now when you look at the posing, the posing, these athletes have to pick the right kind of music that matches up with their body and with yeah, their exactly. personality. You can't mm -hmm. just throw them out there and give them some ballet music and they can't, they got two left feet. It just doesn't work. Yeah. Well, Lee, uh, Lee Haney, when I remember when I did an interview with you the first time and you were talking about that first Mr. Olympia victory in 1984 and you chose the music from Excalibur because you wanted to send that message that there's a new king and I'm going to come in and I'm going to dominate. I thought that was awesome because you were using the posing music to send a message to the crowd that this is the this is the, the reign of a new champion right now. Yeah, man, that that was uh, I, I had a chance to go see the uh, the movie Excalibur. Mm -hmm. Man, I never will forget seeing King Arthur ride through on his horses and, you know, there was a dread in the land. And all of a sudden, as he's riding, everything started to flourish, the blooms and the buds and life came back to the land. And mm -hmm. that music was like, it, it gave me goosebumps when I heard it. So mm -hmm. it not only touched my head, it also touched my spirit. And I wanted that same thing to be projected when I was on the stage. And apparently it did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it <laughs> and, and, and and being his training partner, I was there watching him practice. Oh yeah, he, yeah. you know he told me I'm going to use Excalibur, and, wow. and and that's another reason why you know I felt posing was so important because he did. He went on that stage. He he, he was the king, you know. Mm -hmm. And and to me, it was like it mattered so much what the routine was and and what it represented for you. So you know, yeah, that's what I did when I started doing my own posing routines. Yeah, Rich, you had your brother, right? Didn't he compose music? One of, one of the years in 87, my brother got so inspired by, you know, 
my passion that he wrote a song, It's My Destiny. And yeah. it was all about what I did as a, you know, as a bodybuilder. And it was, it was pretty cool. So I used, you know, I used that song. They actually use it for the Olympia, you know, as the Olympia song for a couple of years. When I go in a competition, if I don't go 100%, 110%, you know, I can't win. I have to go psychologically, physically, all the way. It's like, if I don't win, I'll die. And I want to say, too, uh, Lee, with Lee, you know, I, I got the utmost respect for Hunter and so proud of him. Thank you. But, man, when he hit the stage, I said, that's Lee LeBrado's boy right there. Mm -hmm. I said, because Thank Lee didn't leave no stone unturned. He made sure when Hunter hit the stage, he displayed himself at his very best. And, man, I just want to uh, just congratulate you on that. I was so proud to see that. It made me feel great to see a guy with that type of mass, that type of physique, displaying himself at his very best. So there you go, Lee. Perfect, I'm gonna man. I'm gonna let him know that you said that because I'm uh, I'm literally 50 feet away from the gym that he's training in right now. We got we got a big <laughs> gym here at headquarters, and I'm gonna go out there and say, hey. Lee Haney put you up there and said that you better do a darn good job. Or else. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you, you know, as a fan, it's not something you can just teach somebody, right? Being a professional bodybuilder, number one, you can, you can show them they got to still do the work um, and do the work when other people aren't around, like, you know, cook the food, eat the food, get the rest, do the reps and all that. Other stuff. You can only do so much, but whatever influence you've had, because I know you're not in there lifting the kind of weights he's lifting. He has to lift. He's got to put that extra weight on there, right? 
So with all the tools that you have and all the stuff that you provide him, I mean, kudos to Hunter because he's clearly used you as a role model and a guiding, guiding light, but he had to do the work. And that's, he's gotta, that's very he's, individual. He's got to do the work, Sean, you know, and that's the thing that uh, most people get that, you know, some people don't, you know, um, but he is literally OCD about training. This kid literally eats diet food year round. He just eats mm -hmm. more of it. He reminds me of Rich Gaspari. Yeah, I know how intense Rich used to be. You don't just you, you don't inherit that. You either have so, it. Or you don't. Li listen, listen. When uh, uh, when we were on that uh, when we were on that Grand Prix circuit, I knew that Rich Gaspari was gonna uh, stay on his diet. So I better stay on my diet. Otherwise, mm -hmm. I was gonna get blown off that stage. You know, because uh, again, it takes that kind of one mindedness. And listen, all of us got that. Okay. Because we didn't get here by accident, mm -hmm. you know, but you have to have that one mindedness, you know, and, and focus, you know, and uh, it, because bodybuilding requires that at, at this level, you know? Yeah. yeah. You know, there's only going to be one guy to win the Olympia and you guys have done so many Olympias. Um, was there a point in your career when you were competing in the Olympia where you said, you know, it's not really about winning. It's just about being inspired and improving to be my best, you know, to try and outdo what I did before. No, no. <laughs> 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 I knew, I knew, we all I wanted to win. My heart. Rich was that assassin. Lita Brother was that assassin. And John Ray, he, he teased me and called me uncle, but I know he wanted to put my head on a platter. I'll never, I'll, I'll never, I'll never forget. I know they was trying to kill me. <laughs> I'll never, I'll never forget in 89 and Remini, you know, I guys, I, I, I had been improving year and I'll never forget backstage and I'm walking past Lee and he just kind of looks at me and goes, I got my eye on you, Labrada. <laughs> breakfast almost over. 15 minutes. I'm just gonna... Give me five minutes. Sorry guys. I'm over here. Uh, we're going to close down breakfast and I'm not going to miss my breakfast during this interview, but I will tell you this. <laughs> Uh, although Lee probably never experienced that, Lee, you got to hear it from somebody that did. And, and I know LeBron experienced it, and so did Rich. Uh, there's, there's a mental transition that takes place on the hunt. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe, I don't, I don't know. Lee, I thought you were at your best at your last Olympia. That's my personal opinion. You were barely 31 years old. I thought you looked your best that year. I don't know how everything worked in your universe, but as a fan, and, and I consider myself a qualified expert. I thought 1991, Lee, you hit your peak and you sailed off in the sunset. No one else has ever done that. I watched Barry Sanders do that, sail off at his peak, and everyone begged for him to come back because he still had gas in the tank. But for me, and I think Labrada and Gaspar experienced this, there was that moment of reckoning when we realized, okay, we've done all we can, and now let's figure out how to make this transition without getting hurt. And we recognize it. It's, it's too far out of reach. I mean, mind you, I'm looking at Ronnie Coleman saying it's too far out of reach. So another one of the, another goat out there, no one was catching up to Ronnie Coleman in 2001, least of all me, although Jay Cutler arguably could have actually won that contest uh, depending on how you looked at it. But since I was in fourth place in that last Olympia, now I got Jay Cutler to deal with coming up in my, in the horizon. I've transitioned. I knew then for me, like, it was over. The hunt was over. There was a lot of air out of the sail and I I'm in survival mode and I need to make a transition. And somewhat something just clicked in my head that look, that's it. They're too big. It's gone too far. And I need to find out something else to do. And luckily for me, I, I was able to stay close to my passion, but there is that moment of reckoning. And it happened for me literally following the press conference in 2001, where I went on to get fourth place. I was done at that moment. Mentally, it, would, it became a business for me at that point. What do you think was your best Olympia? Now, years later, looking back, what was your favorite or your best Olympia? Lee, we'll start with you. Me? Okay. Yeah. Anyone? For me, well, uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, we'll go with the GOAT. Go ahead, Haney. Well, uh, like Sean was saying, 91, and I'll tell you what happened. I had a tendency, you know, because I never, I'll, I always stay within striking distance. But I had the tendency the last five weeks, I would go to a straight six training routine, mm -hmm. which ended up leaving me just a little bit soft and a little bit fatigued as I came closer to the contest. And only about three days before the show, after I feel out that my body start to uh, sort of recover. But for the last Olympia, I stayed in private.
to that six or straight uh, straight six five weeks out, I would use the three on off one. So the last Olympia, I stayed with the three on off one. I stayed full the entire time. The body looked healthy. The muscles were full. I wasn't fatigued. And guess what? Perfect peak, just like Sean was saying. But, you know, I guess, you know, I had enough juice in the tank and enough of all the other things needed to win to keep me afloat and winning during those other deals. But the last one, I agree, Sean, that was the best. I that For some reason, it, I know the reason, it felt easier training for that particular show than the other ones because mm -hmm. guess what? I wasn't over training. Was I that your favorite? Was that your favorite uh, personal experience, Lee, winning that last one in 91? Was that better than 84? Listen, man. Well, 84 was like a dream come true. Yeah. 91 was like waiting to exhale. <laughs> Mission accomplished. Man, listen, <laughs> I had all these cats try to kill me, as I said. So yeah. that was it for me. People said, well, Lee, you didn't announce your retirement. I didn't have to. I knew that was it. Yeah, You know, and uh, I was able to move on, was ready to move on and use my success in other deals. So it was a, it was it. It was no wanting to come back, man. I was finished. Ah, that was it. I was shocked. I had nothing else left to give. <laughs> yeah. That's a great way to go. That was a great way to go out. I mean, being yeah, a fan of the sport, I watched a lot of careers come and go. I don't think anyone had a better send off than that. Yeah. Hey, Rich, how about you? You got second three years in a row. Was any one of those particularly the most important or the one that meant the most to you? I think uh, 88 was probably like my best year that I'd I be mean, As Sean was saying, you know, when I was biting at Lee's heels from 85, 86, 87, I kept trying to like beat him. I decided when I went into 88, I was just going to go in the best shape that I could be in to go on that show and the, and the winner, you know, the winner takes all whoever's going to win. And I went into that show. It was a great experience. You know, I, I came in, I still was able to keep second. Mm -hmm. and all the, you know, Lee talks about all these assassins. Well, I was the guy second with all the other guys behind like Lee Labrada and Barry DeMay all wanting to beat me to get yeah. into that second place spot. So I did that. And then going to those grand prix and then winning the, you know, the Arnold. So that period. And then unfortunately I got injured and things started going downhill from there with, yeah. uh, with my with my body, which just wasn't responding because, you know, I pushed my body to the limits to go against genetic freaks like Lee Labrada and Lee Haney. I really had to push my body to the limits to get it to look the way it did. Yeah, it seemed like 88 was the year where a lot of guys uh, just came into their best. They said, whatever happens, I'm just going to come in my absolute best. You know, Barry DeMay did it also. Lee Labrada did it also. Mike Quinn, too. Mike Quinn. Yeah, Mike Quinn. Yeah. Didn't, have, didn't have a pretty body, but he was in shape. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was a great Olympia. How about you, Lee? You know, you know what, uh, John, I, I want to say that, you know, in my mindset was never to go on stage and beat anybody. It That wasn't the mindset that I had. Mm -hmm. uh, from day one, I said, listen, this bodybuilding is saying, Arnold and Robbie, Zane, Platts, these are the kings of bodybuilding. Then I said to myself, what can I do to become a combination of all of these different people? Forget the legs of Platts. I love his presentation, you know. <laughs> Tom was, he was weird, totally different. So I always each year tried to be better than the Lee Haney of the previous year. I never tried to compete against anyone. I just tried to look like what bodybuilding said it wanted to see and look like. Mm -hmm. And so when you see people like uh, like Lee Labrada, like Rich, you know, like Sean, we were the best of the best at what we were gifted with genetically and through hard work and de determination and having the scientific knowledge of nutrition. We could never compete against each other, really. It was all left up to the eye of the beholders, which were the judges. Mm -hmm. You can't do anything about that. Yeah. So you just have to bring the best you that you can bring with the best presentation and hopefully the chips will fall where they may. And then at the end of the game, OK, how can I take all of this hard work and dedication and turn it into.
to some an economy. And I can say all of us speaking with you today, being able to take our fantasy of bodybuilding and our hard work and be able to forge a living with it. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Yeah. It's crazy yeah. because I'm looking at our, the length of all of our careers. But there was only two years in our careers where we were all on the same stage. The 1988 Olympia in Los Angeles and the 1991 Olympia was the only two times that we were all on the same stage in our careers. Yeah. yeah. And in the 88 Olympia and the 91 are both historic, in my opinion. Yeah. You know, the, the 88 Olympia was just on another level because it was my first, I'm a rookie and I'm up there with my idols for me personally. That was just Los Angeles, the Olympia. It was just huge. I remember all the stars that were in the house, Gregory Hines. Think about the personalities that were at that show watching us. So when we had the weigh in, yeah. I remember Gaspari, when Gaspari weighed in, I go, he's too light. He's too small. <laughs> Who were you, Rich? 207 pounds, 204 uh, pounds that year? Uh, I was, was like 20, 208, 208. Yeah, you were the first bodybuilder, Rich Gaspari. Rich's focus this year was reducing his body weight uh, over, uh, over last year. He felt it was too heavy last year and appeared too blocky on stage. And making his waist look small, he feels he'll be able to uh, be more of a threat, more of a viable threat to, to Lee. 209 and a half pounds. Yeah, you were, you were small. I, I just thought, because I remember you competed heavier, right? So, yeah. but then you showed off the conditioning. It was ridiculous. And then, of course, in 91, you know, I had won the Arnold Classic, and I thought it was just going to be me against Haney. And, of course, Dorian Yates upset the Oppicart there. And, of course, Labrado is still spoiling and killing me. Um, but that was, that. those two years were stand out amongst all of my career with you guys on that stage during 1988 and 99. Great memories. Yeah. Hey Lee Labrada, how about how about you? What what Olympia stands out for you? The one that was most special, the ones that you were John, in. John, you know what? I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna say uh, I'm gonna pick up where Lee Haney left off, and I'm gonna say that it's the journey, it's the path that makes all of us uh, as champions. In other words, it's not you know a highlight of one particular year. Sure, I I, I took second. Uh, before, you know, took some thirds, took some fourths, et cetera. You know, uh, they all have their, their special moments and that type of thing. But I'm going to say it's the path that makes the champions, mm -hmm. you know, and by the grace of God, we've uh, been able to live out a dream. Each one of us have been able to live out a dream uh, that, that many can, can only fantasize about. And then not only that, but to transition over and uh, to be able to uh, continue making a living you know, from a sport that we love and we cherish and, and to stay involved in. So for me, it was really just about the, uh, uh, about uh, just the, the multitude of the years, you mm -hmm. know, uh, uh, the, the first one in 87 stands out to me only because I remember the auditorium in Sweden being so packed with people, yeah. you know, and, and the lights so blinding and that as I was stepping on stage, I could only see the silhouettes of the heads. Guys, you remember what that looked like back in the day. And the flash bulbs start going off because it wasn't digital photography back then. And I thought to myself, oh, my God. And when I put that first <laughs> foot on the stage, yeah. it's I am stepping on hallowed ground. This yeah. is the contest that Oliva competed in, that Schwarzenegger competed in, that Larry Scott competed in. You know, I'm, I'm sitting there looking around at guys that I'd, I'd only seen in magazines. And I thought to myself, oh my God, it's like, it's gotta be the feeling that a football player uh, gets going into the Super Bowl for the first time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Amen. So what do you guys feel about doing the commentary this year at the Olympia? That's gotta be pretty exciting, huh? That's going to be fun. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I, I mean, I still, I'm like, as all these guys, I'm still a fan. You know, yeah. Bodybuilding. I, you know, I, it was really cool to do the open last year. And I know Lee, you're going to enjoy doing the open. I'm doing the 212 and uh, I know Lee's doing the, the classic. So no, it's, it's, I, I enjoy seeing these guys the way I was a fan when I was a kid. And now I'm a fan as an older <laughs> fan. watching these guys. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. We still got that. We still got that kid inside us, guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I hope I hope we don't get booted off, Sean, after we uh, do the <laughs> thing. <laughs> hey, hey, either your social media is going to go up or it's going to go down. <laughs> what is that guy follow. doing? What kind of pose is that? He weighs 270 yeah. pounds. What is he doing? He can't do a leader by the pose. He can't yeah. do an pose. 
the matter with it? He got the prettiest league, you know? So, yeah. Welcome to the jungle, man. They're either going to love you or they're going to hate you. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Are you guys looking forward to seeing any certain competitors this year? I mean, yeah, I'm hungry. excited to actually see, you know, Lee's son. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, the next generation. Yeah, you know, you know what's funny on 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 that note, the uh, you know that next generation note. Uh, first time Hunter competed in the um, uh, in uh, a, a pro show, um, I, I start getting texts from these guys. You know, I'm getting I get texts <laughs> from from Flex Wheeler and from Kevin Leverone and from Sean, and you know, it's like um, it, it. I feel like uh, he's the, uh, the uh, our kid, like he's just the next generation. Yeah. You know, yeah. from you know from uh, uh, from from our, our our time. You know, so. Yeah. Exciting times. Exciting. Yeah. It's pretty yeah. exciting. Yeah. Listen, this is the biggest Olympia. At the end of the day, we're coming out of a pandemic. Uh, we got to get props to Jake Wood because anybody else, if this show was in anyone else's hands, it's not actually happening. So huge props to them. The prize money is actually going up this year. Um, and of course, our, our, our boy Lee Haney is going to be recognized. Uh, again, here he is getting another award uh, <laughs> as if he doesn't have enough on his fireplace at home. But uh, it's going to be an awesome weekend, man. So obviously, uh, Dan Solomon running the show with Tamar L. Gundy and the whole Olympia team giving us the platform to continue living out our, our childhood dream here. Uh, we know there's a lot of guys that aren't with us in the form of Joe Weider and Larry Scott and, and Ed Corney uh, and even current bodybuilders and guys we actually competed with. We're still living the dream. And uh, hopefully the kids that are coming up are looking at the camaraderie that we have, the, the ability for us to give back in our own unique ways with the Lee Haney show and the Brada show and the Gaspari nutrition and the things that we're, we're, we're showing the youth. Hopefully the guys competing now are paying attention to what we're doing so that when we're gone, this thing continues on because the, the dream of Joe and Ben, who would have ever thought that it would continue on this many years after Ben Weider passed away in 08, Joe Weider took 2013. And here we are still living the dream that they created for us as kids. I mean, kids, yeah. we're, you know, we're 50, 60s. I'm a grandfather. Lee, you're a grandfather. I mean, we're yeah. up there and it's still going uh, by the grace of God through Jake Wood and the people that he's put in place. And now we're all going to have this one voice, our own individual opinions. And then, of course, on Sunday, we can Monday morning quarterback on social media to see how many people like us or hate us. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Sean, props to you for getting all these guys together. I think this is going to really be an exciting Olympia just for that fact alone. And uh, I want to thank all you guys for joining us today. And I'm really excited to uh, see you at the Olympia in a few weeks. And uh, it, was, it was fantastic having all you guys here today. I know everybody's busy. So I'm, I thank all of you for taking the time out to do this. It was a real pleasure for me. Thank you, John. All right, boys. We'll see you in one doing. month. Thanks. Hey, love, love y'all, brothers, man. Love y'all. Right. Raider Nation, baby. Love you guys. Raider Take care. Nation. All right. <laughs> take care, guys. Bye. Take care. All right. Take, take care. care, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.